just what is the new covenant? You hear a lot about that, especially today when, uh, for example, if you're talking to your friends, your family members, and you bring up something that uh, is part of your practice, uh, such as dietary or which days you observe or things like that, you probably have noticed, at least in, sometimes in the past, maybe it stopped along the way, but uh, many of us have gone through the experience of noticing that the subject of Old Covenant versus New Covenant sometimes comes up. Because people assume that if you're doing something that's defined in the Old Covenant law, then you're putting yourself under the Old Covenant. But the, the, the question then comes to mind, just what is the New Covenant? What are we talking about when we uh, talk about the New Covenant? Many Protestants believe and have believed since the early years of the Reformation that humankind from the beginning, that's when humankind consisted of Adam and Eve, two people, but from the beginning was under a covenant of works. Have you ever heard of that? How many, how many former Presbyterians do we have here? Conservative Presbyterians. Then if you are a conservative Presbyterian, not, not the modern liberal brand, they, uh, who knows what they believe. Uh, I mean, they're into gay marriage and all kinds of things nowadays, but uh, the old school uh, Calvinist, Reformed Presbyterian, and Reformed Baptists, uh, they'll tell you all about the covenant of works. That's what Adam was placed under. This was when Adam and Eve were in their, uh, their they were first created. They were made pristine and perfect originally. And so God says, here is my law. Basically, it's summarized in this commandment, uh, do not eat from that tree, the one in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the day that you do, you'll die. And so Adam was under a covenant of works. And in that covenant, Adam was promised blessings in life. Don't eat of it, rather eat of the tree of life and any other fruit, but not that one. Anything in the garden, but except for that. So he was promised uh, blessings in life upon obedience to the terms of the covenant. Seems pretty simple, doesn't it? Seems like you can just stay away from that tree. But he didn't, of course, and I, I'm sure that there's a lot of symbolism in the story. Not to say that there's not a literal tree in the midst of the garden, but it symbolized a whole lot more than just uh, something that bears fruit. And also in, the, in this covenant of works, he was promised cursings and death upon disobedience to the terms of that covenant. So he was under a covenant of works, supposedly. You see the similarity, how similar it is to the covenant that God placed Israel under. Uh, you could call that a covenant of works. So when the first Adam, you know, well, there's another Adam that came later, the second man Adam, the last man Adam. When the original Adam disobeyed, he brought cursing and death not only to his immediate family, himself and his wife, but to all of his progeny. That's all of us. That's why we die, according to this, uh, this particular understanding. But God had a plan in place to restore humankind to a right relationship with himself. Thus, we have what is called in reform circles, the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace. So those are your two basic covenants. The covenant of works, the original covenant, and then you have the covenant of grace. Now, we're told by the reformed tradition that both the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, if you want to call it that, and the new covenant, that both were established within the covenant of grace. So the old covenant was established under the larger umbrella of the covenant of grace, just as the new covenant. Now the, West, the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, Article 7, Paragraph 5 states this. It says, this covenant was differently, and talking about the covenant of grace, was differently administered in the time of the law, meaning in the time of Moses, the time of Israel ancient Israel, and in the time of the gospel. You get, you get what he's saying here. He's saying this covenant, the covenant of grace, was it differently administered in the time of the law and in the time of the gospel. Different types of administration. Under the law, it was administered by promises, prophecies, sacrifices, circumcision, the paschal lamb, and other types of ordinances delivered to the people of the Jews, all for signifying Christ to come. Uh, you know, there are elements of truth in all of this. I wouldn't dispute it. It's just that you don't find these specific terms, covenant of works, covenant of grace, uh, in the, the, uh, the scriptures. 
It says, uh, delivered, these were delivered to the people, all for, uh, for signifying Christ to come, which were for that time sufficient and efficacious. In other words, if you were living back there, those things in the law, the sacrifices and all the other things, they were efficacious for you because it was under this larger umbrella of the covenant of grace. Through the operation of the Spirit to instruct and build up the elect in faith in the promised Messiah, so you were for you know, you were living before the Messiah came, and yet you still ha had access to this grace uh, that uh, he makes accessible. It's kind of retroactive, I guess you could say. Uh, by whom, seeking of the Messiah, by whom they had full remission of sins and eternal salvation, and it's called the Old Testament, or the Old Covenant. Okay. Paragraph 6 goes on to say that the Old and New Covenants are, quote, not two covenants of grace differing in substance, but one and the same under various dispensations, different administrations, but they're one and the same. Okay, that, I, you can kind of follow along with that, but again, it uses some terms uh, in order to try to categorize things in Scripture, it uses some terms that are not necessarily found in Scripture. You do find terms such as covenant, terms such as grace, such as works and all that, but you don't have those specific expressions, covenant of works and covenant of grace. But you get what they're saying here. Now the term here, dispensations, various under various dispensations it says in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, it's also, these are also called economies, which refer to divinely established arrangements regarding the relationship between God and humankind. And this brings me to the second view now. The second view, and this one is probably more popular today than the old uh, Reformed tradition that I just described to you is. And this is what is behind all the popular books you see in the Christian bookstores. You see them advertised online, all these things about the coming Antichrist, uh, all this stuff about the rapture. Be ready for the rapture. Are you rapture ready? The pre-tribulation rapture, the last seven years of tribulation, all of this grows out of this second school of thought that's more popular today and came much later than covenant theology, and it's called dispensationalism. In its original form, there were said to be seven dispensations. Now today, you have what is, you know, you have uh, dispensationalism is being revised a little bit. You have what is known as progressive dispensationalism, and they say, well. Um, maybe there's, there's not seven because scripture knows where it says any such thing it's just what what has happened is people have divided different uh, segments of history and scripture into this seven and it, you read it and uh, understand it kind of makes sense but others say well wait a minute M maybe there are only four well but you know when, when I look at all that when I look at the debate back and forth, I think why, why even try to divide it up in any way just see God working through all these different circumstances uh, who cares have seven or four or, or whatever but anyway originally there were seven they were said to be seven and you still find that in the older dispensationalist books and in fact there are some uh, left uh, some leftovers you might say some of the older the people uh, involved in dispensationalism Hal Lindsey being one of them you know the popular book uh, late great planet earth bestseller he still has his TV program uh, you still see he's very he's pretty old now but uh, he's one of the remaining ones that sticks to the old system belief in the seven dispensations and these seven dispensations are seven ages or seven economies they include number one uh, the age of innocence that was before Adam fell before the fall the age of innocence man in his pristine perfection first created by God but then it wasn't too long afterward that uh, they that sin entered the picture and that always you have you have a set of rules up at the in the beginning you have a set of conditions that must be met in other words the you know the this is what you're to do and then also you have uh, the blessings the promised blessings and then you have uh, the the uh, the penalty for breaking you know the rules so Adam and Eve broke the rules, as it were, and of course they were driven from the Garden of Eden and punishment of death was uh, ensued and followed for all mankind. And then number two, the age of conscience. And that's from the fall to the flood, the age of conscience. 
is what it's called. I, you know, how do you come up with that? Why are other ages not the age of conscience? But anyway, that's what it's called. And then you have the age of human government. That's from the flood to the Tower of Babel. And you see how that, well, the age of conscience ended with the flood. That was the penalty for violating conscience, you know, and so on. But uh, the human government began then. That's when they began to build the Tower of Babel, the age of human government. And it extended from the flood to the, what happened at the Tower of Babel. And you see what the punishment was because man sought to basically take the place of God. So driven away. So you see how they can, dry, they can come up with these different dispensations based on a few principles there. But if you really look closely, you can probably divide it up further than that. Or you can probably combine two or three of them and, you know, narrow it out or, or make it only a few dispensations. And then you come to the age of promise, the dispensation of promise, and it extends from Abraham to Moses. And it ends, it ends with the refusal to enter Canaan and 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. That was the punishment because of their refusal, because of Israel's uh, stubbornness and rebellion. This is the age of promise, when the promises were given to Abraham and his seed. And then you come to the uh, dispensation of law. Dispensation of law. And it extends from Moses to the crucifixion of Christ. And it ends, it ends technically, at least the visible sign of its end comes in A.D. 70 when the temple is destroyed. When Jerusalem is besieged, the Jews are scattered. So you see how they could come up with that. That's the end of the age of law. And then you have the age of grace from the crucifixion to the rapture of the saints. And from the, so then therefore from the, age, the end of the age of the law, the dispensation of law, uh, to the millennium, which is number seven, you have this age of, gra of grace. It's a great, the gap, it's a gap. I'll, I'll tell you how they come up with that or what scriptures they use in just a few moments to justify that. And then of course the seventh, as I mentioned, was the, is the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ from Jerusalem. So you see all, and it, it ends, by the way, it ends in a rebellion and fire coming down out of heaven and consuming the, re, the uh, rebels. That's how it ends. So you, each one ends with some kind of punishment. It begins with a set of conditions, specific conditions that are required to fulfill. Now, if you're, if you're in some different age from the age of law, then obviously the law doesn't pertain to you. You see how it is easily get rid of the law in that way. The law of Moses. Hey, that's for a different dispensation. And there are actually people who believe that. Now, dispensationalists themselves are carved up into different camps. Some are hyper-dispensationalists. In other words, they see the apostles continuing this in the age of the law, the dispensation of the law, and their ministry was to Israel until Paul came along. Now, he, he was given a new dispensation begins there. So you have different ways of, of carving up the scriptures, of dividing the word of truth, in other words. Now, again, as I mentioned, I'll explain how they come up with this, uh, this gap. The gap theory, the gap, it's not talking about the creational gap theory, but this is a different gap theory. It's a gap between the crucifixion. Uh, it's a gap in Israel's history, actually, is what it amounts to. Uh, the idea, again, God is working with Israel in the dispensation of promise and of law. Begin with Abraham, then the nation of Israel, and then you come to the time of Moses, you have this dispensation of law. So he's working with the nation of Israel, and he, he, you have all these prophecies about Israel and Israel's future. You have Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, uh, and, and it's about Israel, about the people in the land. And it brings you to 490 years, and then you're supposed to, something happens during that time, it, every, all this, everything's supposed to come about. And you're supposed to have this, you know, the, the new age. Israel reestablished as a nation. You have the, the tabernacle or the temple restored, sacrifices, all these things restored and uh, brought back. But here's what happens. Here's, here's the way it is explained. I'm not going to go to Daniel's prophecy, but in the 70 weeks prophecy, it is acknowledged that, there are, that the prophecy pertains to 49 weeks of years. I'm sorry, 70 weeks of years, which is 490 years. 
But those last seven years, we're told, those last seven years, that you know, between the 69th and 70th week, that's when Christ came, when he was crucified. That's when the age that God was dealing with Israel ended. The end of that dispensation. Actually, it didn't completely end. It was put on hold. So the, the stopwatch, it stopped. God stopped working with Israel at that point. And now then, he's going to put it, this is last week, this last week, off into the future. That's the last seven years. Now you're beginning to get the picture from a dispensationalist point of view. I'm pointing these things out to you because if you hear some of these TV preachers, you may not know what you're hearing. You say, wow, that's interesting. That makes sense. But you, under, you need to understand where he's coming from. And this idea is this last week in the 70 weeks prophecy, this last week of years, which is seven years, is removed like 2,000 years off into the future. And it will find its fulfillment back there. So you have a gap. Hence the gap theory between the 69th and the 70th weeks. Normally the 70th week follows immediately the 69th, doesn't it? but not in this case. No, it's removed by about 2,000 years, maybe more. 2,000 so far and counting. And this is the age that none of the prophets foresaw. None of them foresaw it. This is the age of grace. It is the church age. You see, none of the prophets foresaw the church. They didn't know the church was going to exist. All they're about is Israel. This is what God's going to do for Israel. But now they have this gap that none of the prophets saw. And it's the church age. Age of grace. Of course, the good news about that, you know what the good news is. We're not under that dispensation of law anymore. So all these preachers telling you you ought to be keeping the law. No, no, no. You're in the age of grace. So dispensationalism works real well for some people. Some people who want to believe that. But anyway, that's, that's the idea that you have there. And just on the surface, for me, just reading scriptures, I think, boy, that seems like a, a reach. You can read the books, and it sounds real exciting. And sometimes you even read, and you're reading along and seeing all this stuff and how they're making it all work together like a jigsaw puzzle. Hal Lindsey is the one that came up with that, I believe. Maybe somebody before him did. He said the Bible, understanding the Bible, is like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. No, it, it's really not. You're really not. You don't, you don't read a verse over here and say, well, let me find some other verses. I could stick with this. That way I'll make it all fit together. What you do, you wind up whittling off the corners on the pieces and making your own picture. That's what they've done. That's what dispensationalists tend to do. But anyway, uh, that's, that's, that, that's what they do. They, they form this model and then they go through the scriptures and various scriptures they take and plug it into the model. And uh, hey, it looks exciting. You look at that and say, wow, look at that. I never saw that before. You go tell your neighbors, wow, look at this. Did you know that? And next thing you know, you're looking forward for that secret pre-tribulational uh, rapture. You see, that's, the church has to be taken out of the way. The church age has to come to an end before that 70th week can begin. That's the idea. That's where the secret pre-tribulational rapture thought comes from. And then, of course, you can go to various scriptures, New Testament, Matthew 24, different ones that talk about the being caught up to meet Christ in the air. And you can reinterpret those and make it fit the model. That's exactly what they do. But in any case, that's what you have here. And I want to go to one of the scriptures. Now, again, there, there are different, different schools of thought within dispensationalism itself. Progressive dispensationalism seems today to have kind of taken over, but the old school dispensationalism, it's still around. It's still there. And you still see the older writers still writing and supporting that uh, idea. I'd like to go to Ephesians, the third chapter. Ephesians chapter 3. And here Paul, the Apostle Paul, does talk about something. And you can make this fit extremely well on the dispensational scheme. Ephesians chapter 3 talks about a certain mystery. It's a mystery. You get the impression here that nobody had this before. This is a secret. A new revelation. Even the other apostles apparently in the time when Jesus was still on the earth, they didn't have it. That's what you, you get. You, at least that's some put forward that idea. So let's read it in uh, Ephesians chapter 3. We'll just begin there in verse 1. 
for this reason that Paul has been talking about the fact that God has made one body from both Jews and Gentiles. One body. He's talking about the church. The church of God. That's the one body, the body of Christ. And he says in chapter 3, verse 1, for this reason, because we now have this one body that we see has formed, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, you people from other nations, nations outside of Israel, that's, that's the people, that was his primary mission field, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. How the mystery, the mysterion, the secret, the secret was made known to me by revelation. Whoa. So he received some revelation. Now, where do you think he got this revelation? When did he get it? Well, hold your place here. Look back at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2. Let's show you how you can make a scripture or two fit the model so that you could come out with this dispensational scheme. So when did Paul get this revelation that was, it was made known to him? This is, it was given to him, he says. Well, back in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse 2. He says, Paul said, I'll just start in verse 1. I must go on, I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now he wants to be humble here. So he, he doesn't want to, want to directly connect himself with this vision, but he's really talking about himself. Most commentators agree with that. He said, I know a man in Christ. Yeah, that would be himself. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. What he's saying here is it was such a vivid vision. It was so real that he couldn't tell whether or not it was just something going on in his mind, you know, a vision, or whether or not he was actually bodily there. So this is how real it was. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter. So he got new revelations there. Things he couldn't even tell about. But apparently he was able to tell about some of the things. And you see the idea is that this must be where he got the mystery. The secret that was hidden from the ages. That's the idea. It doesn't say that, but... That's how you, you know, that's how the dispensationalists, some of them, will put this, these scriptures together. So back to Ephesians 3. He says, uh, again, you've heard about how God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. They say it refers to that, what that we just read. As I have written be, uh, briefly, when you read this, or when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. So this is something new, he seems to be saying. Something other generations never saw. So there you have it. 69th week, the 70th week, big gap. Nobody saw that coming. Nobody saw that. But Paul, having received this special revelation, he sees it according to the dispensationalist view. As it is, again, verse 5, which has not been made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, wait a minute. That's the mystery? Really? You mean Jesus didn't tell the other disciples, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations? He only said, only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Earlier in his ministry. He didn't, he didn't say this other thing later in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 28. Really? This is something only now being revealed? Well, let's question that. Let's question that. Uh, and and find, see if we can figure out what exactly Paul did mean here. Is he really saying this is a brand new revelation? Nobody before ever knew anything about it? 
Is that what he's saying or is he saying something else? Well, let's look at a couple of other scriptures. Let's go to uh, uh, let's go back to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3. We went through the book of Galatians a while back and you will recall some of this in chapter 3 and let's begin in uh, verse uh, 7 or 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing, now notice what he says about the scripture, the scripture, not himself, not some secret vision he's received and nobody else has received it. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, there it is. This was already in scripture, so why would that be a new revelation? The scripture that God would, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Get, did you know that? Did you know the gospel unto salvation was preached before to Abraham? That's what he says right here. That doesn't sound like a brand new revelation. They just came down out of heaven or he went up to heaven to get, does it? No. Saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. There it is. That's the content of the mystery. In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham the man of faith. So what he's saying is the Gentiles, it, it was told beforehand to Abraham. The gospel was preached to him. That the Gentiles, the non-Jews, non-Israelites, would be justified by faith. Would be blessed along with Abraham. And he uses scripture here to prove it. So what does he mean? What on earth could he mean back in uh, chapter 3? Well, we'll come back to that again. Ephesians chapter 3. We'll come to, I want to go back to Isaiah chapter 19. We have a very interesting uh, prophecy here. A very interesting one, I would say. And if you, want, if you wonder whether or not it was revealed as to whether non-Israelites would be included as the people of God, let's go back there and see what you say after reading this. See what you think. In Isaiah 19, Isaiah 19, and let's take up the account in verse, uh, along about verse 18. In that day, talking about a future time, in that day there will be five cities in the land of Egypt that speak the language of Canaan. No, wait, what's he mean here? In other words, they speak, they have something in common, common with the Hebrews who were, lived in the land of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord of hosts, to Yahweh. Wait a minute, Egyptians swearing allegiance to God, the true God, the God of Abraham? That's what it says. One of these will be called the city of destruction, or probably the better translation, the city of sun. The city of sun. As you find that, I think, in the, perhaps in the, well, certainly in the Dead Sea Scrolls and some certain other manuscripts. But he goes on, verse 19, In that day there will be an altar to the Lord... Guess where? Look at this. In other words, there's going to be worship going on. Worship of Yahweh, the God of Abraham. An altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. And a pillar to the Lord at its border. In other words, the land of Egypt. The Egyptians are going to recognize the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the true God and they will worship him. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. When they cry to the Lord because of oppressors, he will send them a savior and defender and deliver them. And the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. Know him. Not just find out, oh, oh, he really does exist. I guess the Hebrews are right. No, more than that, know him in relationship, in covenant relationship with him. And worship with sacrifice and offerings. And they will make vows to the Lord and perform them. And the Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing. And they will return to the Lord and he will listen to their pleas for mercy and heal them. So is he the God of other nations as well? According to this, he's the God of the Egyptians. The Egyptians will turn to him. And the Egyptians will become his people. In that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Now he brings in another group here. 
Look at this, from Egypt to Assyria, and Assyria will come into Egypt, and Egypt into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. I'm not talking about worshiping idols either. I'm talking about worshiping the God of Abraham. In that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria. Or Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria. Get that? They're worshiping together. They're, part, they, they're all part of the people of God. That's what he's telling us here. A blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people. Did you know that? That Egypt, or the, <laughs> he calls Egypt his people? Well, I thought it was just Israel, wasn't it? Isn't that what Paul, didn't Paul tells us? He, he's the one that got the mystery and found out about the conversion of the Gentiles. Well, we'll get back to that in just a moment. Blessed. Well, again, verse 20. Read that, read, let's read that again. In that, that day Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has said, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands. Assyria? The enemies of God's people, the Assyrians? I thought they were the worst of the worst. Didn't they attack Israel? Didn't they take Israel captive? And didn't God say, I'll punish them because of the way they, they treated them. They went overboard with it. And yet it says, they're the work of his hands. And Israel, my inheritance. You see the three together? Egypt and Assyria. Look at it on a map. You see the Assyrians, Israel, and Egypt. That's a, whole, that's a huge area covering a lot of people. And they're all... The people of God, he says. So where does Paul come up with this idea that he got this revelation and nobody had it before him? Well, obviously he's not really saying that exactly. What he's saying here, let's read it again in verse 5, back in Ephesians 3, verse 5, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. In other words, we see it more clearly now because we're living it. We're seeing Gentiles converted to the faith. They're converted to the Abrahamic faith. They're worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not the idols that their nations are associated with so frequently in Scripture. But they're turning to the God of Abraham and receiving God's Messiah that he sent to, to Israel. So what do you, uh, that's all he's saying, really he says, now we're seeing it play out. We see it more clearly than any past generation could see it. He's not saying it wasn't revealed. He can't be saying that because you see, it, you see that it is revealed very plainly in Scripture. From the very first promise God gave to Abraham, that his seed would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Meaning the Abrahamic blessing would extend beyond the borders of Abraham's lineal descendants into other nations. And they too would become the people of God. And you see it being carried out in, in the prophecies of Scripture. There are other prophecies we could go to. But that's what's going on here. So this dispensational scheme doesn't really work. The mystery that Paul received, the secret withheld from the ages, what he's really talking about here is that now we see it, we see the unfolding of what was previously revealed. And in so doing, we see it in its perfection. We see how God is bringing these things about. And it actually begins with the church. It doesn't end there. There's still a future. There's still a millennial kingdom. But it doesn't end with the church. But it does begin there. And we see God separating a people for himself. Not only from Israel. Not only from the righteous remnant of Israel. But from the nations. And that's what Paul is talking about here. This mystery, this secret he says. Is that the Gentiles, the nations, are fellow heirs. Members of of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, through the good news of Jesus Christ and his coming kingdom. Now, if you just, you know, if you want to, those who want to carve it up and make it different dispensations, say, well, that, all that over there, that, you know, that stuff about Israel, that's not the church. The church lives in the gap between the 69th and 70th week, unforeseen, entirely unforeseen by the, uh, the, the Old Testament prophets. Those who want to say that, and disconnect, disconnect, therefore, Israel from the church and create this radical discontinuity, and that's what they're doing. Uh, they have to ignore the second chapter of Ephesians. 
just back up a few verses there back up and you see that Paul here he's talking about the Jews and Gentiles being one in Christ one in Christ and he says let's see where do we want to begin here don't need to read the entire thing but uh, he speaks let's just start in the verse 13 but now in Christ Jesus you who are once far off who would that be you Gentiles you who are once far he's talking he's, he has the the temple in mind the metaphor of the temple you who were far off you know the Gentiles the uncircumcised they were not allowed into the temple you who are far off have been brought near near to God God dwelt in the temple you see the metaphor here don't you have been brought near by the blood of Christ that's the that's the true sin offering by which the people can draw near for he himself is our peace who has made both us both Jew and Gentile one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility again this is metaphorical he's speaking in reference to the uh, the, the wall that stood in the temple forbidding Gentiles entry on penalty of death this is a wall of hostility it separated Jews from Gentiles he says that wall you know again using this as a metaphor figurative speaking is broken down by abolishing the law of commandments oh good <laughs> by abolishing the law and the commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself a new man in place of the two so making uh, peace so he, he this the commandments and ordinances separating them is what is abolished it's not that the moral law the higher the, the commandments the law in other words the Torah it's not that it has now been set aside not talking about that at all and might re reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross in other words Jew and Gentile alike therefore killing the hostility and he came and preached peace to you who were far off the Gentiles and peace to those who were near the Jews so you see what he's saying here he's made you we were near we Jews we were near doesn't mean all the Jews because some of them were as rebellious as it could be but uh, the we the remnant of Israel we were near and now you've come near you see what he's saying for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father so then you are no longer you are no longer strangers and aliens Do you get that you're now one of us you're now spiritually speaking you're now an Israelite you're now part of the body that is made up of the seed of Abraham that's what he's saying here and you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together again this is a figuratively speaking grows into, a, into the temple of the Lord in whom also you are being built together in the dwelling place of God by the Spirit so what he's saying is that we were near we Gentiles we all we sorry we Jews we came to the temple we worshiped God at the temple we understood God dwelt in a special way in the temple so we came near with our sacrifices and offerings and worship him now you have been brought near with us in other words you are part of the same people so really he's uh, in Galatians 3 of course or the book of Galatians we won't go back there but uh, you will recall that he says if you are Christ then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise in other words you've been made a part of this same people and from God's perspective the two groups are one and the same they're the people of God one is no more or less un in covenant relationship with God than the other so that's what we're told here now then I'd like to go to uh, Hebrews chapter 8 since we are talking about the new covenant since I started off with the question what is the new covenant uh, you see it defined in Hebrews chapter 8 and I might mention this too that some dispensationalists might have you believe that there are two different new covenants there's the new covenant that Christians are under and there's a new covenant designed for Israel because they can't help but look at what Jeremiah 31 says when God says I will make a new covenant with 
the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So I said, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, he's going to make this new covenant with them, and he'll put his law in their hearts. But right now, we're under a, we're in the mystery. We're in the gap. We're a different new covenant. <laughs> and you know, you start looking at scripture for this other new covenant, mm, hard to find, isn't it? I find only the one new covenant. What I do find in Hebrews, the eighth chapter, is that the writer of the book of Hebrews confirms that the covenant that God's people today are under, that is to the Christians, if you want to call them that, Messianic believers, whatever you want to call them, uh, people who believe that Jesus is the true Messiah and who have converted, they are under this Jeremiah 31 new covenant. Makes it very clear. Let's, uh, let's take, it, uh, take up the account in verse 6. Verse 6 in uh, Hebrews 8. But as, in, uh, as it is in Christ, as it is, I'm sorry, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old as the covenant, meaning the, the priesthood in the Old Testament, the Aaronic priesthood, so Christ's ministry, his priesthood, is much more excellent than the old priesthood. In other words, it was contained types and shadows pointing to Christ. Much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. So you have a better priesthood and a better covenant. Now again, he's writing to people who are believers, believers in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he's not writing to unbelieving Hebrews and talking about some future covenant. He's talking about the covenant that believers have entered into right now. It says, for if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says the fault was with the people. And it said, you know, you might get the impression there was a fault with the covenant. You could say, well, the fault was with the people who entered into the covenant. That's true. But the, you could also understand this to mean that the covenant itself, not that it was wrong. No, no, it was, it was good as far as it went. But it just didn't go far enough as far as if you're talking about spiritual salvation. But uh, it, it was, it said if it had been faultless, there would not have been an occasion for a second. In other words, uh, it lacks something. It lacks something that the second would supply. And it pointed to the second, in fact. For he finds fault with them, that's the people who entered in the covenant, when he says, Behold, the days are coming, he's quoting from Jeremiah 31, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers, on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. This, this tells you why it's a better covenant. It's right here. I will put my laws into their minds. What laws is he talking about? Oh, these brand new New Covenant laws. That's, no, he's, he's talking about the Torah, the laws of the Torah. Into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall not teach each other his neighbor, and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. In other words, the knowledge of the Lord, true knowledge of God, will be widespread when this covenant is fully established. For they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. So is the first one obsolete? And the answer is yes, it is. Yes, it is. And what is becoming, meaning anything that's becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now, he may have said this because he was aware that the temple would soon be destroyed. And he needed, and the people, some of these Jewish believers needed to be prepared for that. But in any case, it's very clear that the new covenant is superior to the old. It's very clear that the new covenant that these people were under, these believers were under, 
was the same one described in Jeremiah 31. Now, I'd like to go back there. I'm not going to read it again, the whole thing again. I'm just going to read uh, what it goes on to say after the quotation that we just read. In Jeremiah 31, we'll look at uh, the, la the very last part there that we read. It says, For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Then it goes on to say, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord. Now, how long have you been looking up at the heavens at night? You see those stars up there. You see the moon. You see the moon go through the various phases, month after month after month. You see the sun rise in the morning, set in the evening. You see, you see it's different through the different seasons of the year. You see how all that works, don't you? Uh, is that just going to stop one day? Just, just up, you know, okay, that's all. No, it's what he's saying. If the fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Is that a promise or not? I, I say it's a promise. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then I will cast off the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. In other words, yeah, they're, they're sinners. They're big time sinners. And I will cast them off for all those terrible sins that they have committed. But if, if these heavenly, the, these heavenly uh, you know, the sun, moon, and stars, the other heavenly bodies remain before me, uh, the order of things that we see in the skies at night and in the day, if they remain before me, then... So will Israel remain. That's a, that sounds like a pretty solid promise to me. And of course he's talking in terms of establishing the new covenant with them. And we see from these other scriptures that it extends beyond them to the nations. And uh, how he forgives their iniquities and remembers their law no more. But the, one, the thing I want to focus on here is that he will write his law in their hearts. He does this. How does he do that? You know, a contemporary of Jeremiah was Ezekiel. They both prophesied during the same period, during the exile period. And Ezekiel talks about the very same thing in chapter 36. In chapter 36, we want to break into it in uh, along about verse 20. Verse 20. But when they came to the nations, talking about the people of Israel, when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name. In other words, when they left, they were driven out of the land because of covenant breaking. They went to the nations. They went to the nations, and then there they profaned my name. They gave me a bad reputation to the peoples round about. They were supposed to be the model nation to the nations of the world. They were supposed to attract people, the other nations, to themselves and teach them of the God of Israel. But what they do? They got driven out and they went out and made it, gave God a bad reputation. Profaned his name. When they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name. And that people said of them, these are the people of the Lord. And yet, they had to go out of his land. Remind me not to um, embrace that way of life. You know, that's the, the message that seems to be sent here. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations, to which they came. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act. So God is going to do something for Israel, and it's not because he looks down and sees how great they are. So, you know, you've really done a great job. No, he says, you've done a miserable job, a horrible job in obeying me, keeping my covenant. But, so it's not, it's not because of you that I'm doing this. It's because of my name that you've profaned among the nations. But this is what I'm going to do. But for the, hey, by the way, you want to know what grace is? There's grace. That's grace right there. By grace, Israel is saved through faith. It's not of themselves. It's the gift of God. But he does it for his own name's sake. But for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. 
Verse 23, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been performed, profaned, I should say, profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations, the nations will know that I am the Lord. You know, they should have known that through Israel's example. But instead, Israel is driven to the nations, and they profane God's name there. Now, God acts. He says, this is what I'm now going to do. And the nations, when I act, then the nations are going to say, Yahweh, he is God. The God of Abraham, he's God. They will know that I am the Lord. And more than just know it, as we see in other scriptures, they'll embrace it. And they too will become the people of God. Declares the Lord of hosts, or the Lord God, when, the, when through when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all of your uncleanness and from all your idols. Is this, is this because finally they get out there and they, they turn to obedience to God and God says, well, you know, they've turned around, around from their sins now, so uh, I'll restore them. No, no. He said, I'm going to do this to you in spite of you. In spite of you, I'm doing this. And I'm doing it because you've profaned my name. I will cleanse you. Now, we read before, he will write his, he will write his law in their hearts. How does he do this? I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. That's what he's going to do to change them. He takes the initiative. He does it. It doesn't mean that they, it doesn't require their cooperation. Ultimately their cooperation. But he takes the initiative. He puts his spirit in them. And cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So this is how the new covenant differs from the old. It differs because the Spirit of God is placed within the person. The Spirit of God writes His law in the heart. It is internalized now. It's not just something that's out there on the doorposts of your home or out, you know, hanging on the wall someplace or in a table of stone hidden away in, uh, in a room in a tabernacle. It's written in their hearts. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. So God takes the initiative. He does it. He does it by putting his spirit within them. And you think about that, you know, that's really, that's the only way we can live up to his standards. He has to take the initiative. We have to have his spirit. If it, if it left on our own, we'd do what Adam did. Adam, Adam probably had a few advantages we don't have. Yeah. You, know, you think about that. How in the world, after meeting God the way he did, could he go ahead and disobey him after God directly told him, in the day you eat of this particular fruit, do you have all these others, all this other, this, this, you're, you're in paradise, but don't eat that. You think, how in the world could this guy have done it. And you know he was not a flawed individual. God didn't, doesn't make things that are flawed. No, he had everything that any human being could ever hope for as far as, you know, intellect, his ability, capability, and so on, but he failed anyway. What do you think we do on our own without the Spirit of God? We too fail, don't we? That's why Israel failed. Israel failed. They were driven out of the land just as Adam and Eve were driven out of paradise. They too were driven out. And so this is telling us this is how God d delivers a people. He has to take the initiative. He puts his spirit within us. And again, this is, this is not, we've talked about this before, this is not Calvinism where God just takes over and makes you do things. You know, he reaches in there and takes hold of the willer and twists it a little bit or jiggles it some says this is what you now you now you're going to want to do this no he empowers and enables and enlightens by his spirit in other words he makes it so that you really don't have any excuses so he puts his spirit he writes his law with another i think and i think we have experienced that we've experienced that 
we understand that God's law is internalized. It's not merely an external list of rules and regulations that you follow and say, okay, I better do this one so I'll get that blessing. It's not that at all. Not that at all. We understand the intent of God's law. The intent of the Torah. You know, when we speak of the Torah, we're not just speaking of the list of commandments. Far more than that. It's the teaching. The Torah, the word Torah itself, in reference to the first five books of the Bible, those that are attributed to Moses, uh, it, it means the teaching. And it takes in more than just those specific commands or specific statutes, judgments, etc. that God gave to Israel through Moses. Uh, it, it, it takes in the, uh, the story of the Garden of Eden. Jesus cited that. He says, have you not read when the Pharisees questioned him about the permanency of marriage? Have you not read? He, he quoted right out of the book of Genesis. That he who made them in the beginning made them male and female. And for this reason, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. He sees that in the Torah. That's, you understand the intent, the underlying intent. And that's what it means when you have God's law written in your heart. You begin to see it for its full in intent. You're no longer under the law in the sense that you're no longer under its power to condemn you as a sinner. You're under, no longer under its penalty for committing those sins. And you're no longer under its power to increase guilt. And that's what it does for people who are rebellious. You're no longer under the law in that sense, but now you're under the law in the sense that you're empowered to fulfill its intent and its purpose. So it's all really, in one sense, even though Peter says Paul wrote some things hard to be understood, especially those things pertaining to the law, some of those things you kind of stumble, whoa, 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 what do you mean here? But at the end of the day, when you put it all together, it's really not all that hard not all that hard to understand. You understand God gave the Torah, gave us the law. He intends, he intended from the beginning that it be written in our hearts, that it be internalized. And we can thank God that he takes the initiative to do that. He takes the initiative. He writes it in our hearts. So if we don't have it written in our hearts, we can't blame him. Can't blame him. We're the barrier. Let's just make sure the barrier is taken out of the way so God can do his full work of redemption in all of us.